There we go. There we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right, folks. Well, thank you for that introduction. And tonight I'm going to talk about the Occoquan suffrage prisoners. Um, which I have studied these folks because these are the people who were at Lorton uh, in Lucy and you know in where Lucy Burns Museum is now. Uh, and we've done a great deal to kind of recover their story there. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that we actually had women who were arrested and put in jail here in Virginia. We'll talk about why that was a problem later on tonight uh, for picketing the White House. Uh, so let me talk about, uh, let me tell you the, the story of the Occoquan suffrage prisoners. Okay. All right, well, in the early 20th century, the dominant women's suffrage organization in the United States was the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, there's their leader, this is Carrie Chapman Catt. Uh, she was the leader throughout much of the effort in the 20th century to get the right to vote. Uh, and she and the other members of NASA, as they called themselves, believed that they should be talking to politicians, educating them, uh, and lobbying them in a, in a more traditional way. And we'll see why we say traditional in a minute. Uh, what they were hoping to do was convince the state, different states, to support women's suffrage. And then uh, by electing people in those states who supported women's suffrage, you would get congressmen who would support women's suffrage, and that would get the federal amendment approved. So it was kind of a two-step process for them. But in the early 20th century, there's a new voice, too, in uh, the women's suffrage movement. And of course, that's Alice Paul, okay? Alice Paul was a Quaker. She was from New Jersey. And she had a lot of more radical ideas about what women's suffrage should be doing here in, in the United States. Well, Alice was in England um, studying. Uh, Alice had, by the time she was done, a PhD, a law degree, and I think a couple of master's degrees. Um, she went to grad school in England for a while. Uh, I think she at one point was at the London School of Economics. She had a degree, got a degree in economics. She met some very some other people that were very interested in the suffrage movement. Uh, and is Milholland. Uh, Milholland was from New York. She came from a very well-to-do family. Uh, she was a lawyer, uh, and she was one of the first women to actually get a law degree by going to law school. NYU let her in to go to law school. Uh, she was very interested in things like death penalty cases, uh, labor law, and yes, women's suffrage. So I know. Then this this person, Lucy Burns, she's the woman our, our museum is named for. Uh, she became sort of Alice's right-hand man or partner in crime, if you want to put it that way. Uh, she's from Brooklyn, and she was also in Europe going to grad school. Uh, she, like, like Alice, one of the reasons these women are going to grad school in Europe is a lot of American grad schools will not let them in at this point, okay, unless they want to be teachers, okay. And then the third, fourth, the other person that she met was Harriet Stanton Blatch. Um, Harriet Stanton Blatch had a degree in chemistry, okay, and you're probably saying she looks like somebody I know. Yeah, there's her mom, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, okay. So she actually was sort of a second generation suffragist, uh, and her mom and her mom's her mom's big partner, Elizabeth Cady, um, yeah. Susan B. Anthony, they were both dead by this time. So they're sort of the first generation of suffragists. So, all right, now, Alice and Lucy met when they were both in the police station in London after being arrested for taking part in protests. Uh, on, on return to America, Alice found that the national, that, that Carrie Chapman Catt and her friends were too conservative. They were going too slow. This would never be accomplished. And so she created by 1914, 15, she created something called the Congressional Union that evolved into the National Women's Party. Uh, and the National Women's Party actually was, was with us for a long time. I think they finally disbanded the last, in the last couple of years. Paul's emphasis challenged the older suffragists. Uh, they preferred, as I said, to focus on the idea that women were more virtuous than men. Uh, that women uh, needed the vote so they could clean up the mess that men had made. Uh, and they talked about a lot about social housekeeping 
you know, you want the vote so you can deal with issues like temperance, better schools, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And many of the, uh, many of NASA's members had actually been in the WCTU before they got into suffrage. And of course the WCTU was the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which at the time in the late 19th and early 20th century was one of the biggest women's organizations anywhere. Uh, and the WCTU looked not just into temperance, but it also was interested in women's suffrage. Uh, Paul insisted that men and women were equal. And so all this discussion about you know, uh, how social housekeeping and everything like that, no, she's not buying that. Uh, she says women should demand the vote, not ask for it. That's one of the big things that the, the NWP is going to emphasize. Uh, we're demanding the vote. We're not asking you for it. Okay. You want to see a really good PBS um, episode on this? Watch the vote. It's part of the Nash. It's part of the American experience. It's great because it emphasizes that. Now, in addition, uh, okay. So Alice Paul and her friends are afraid it's never going to happen. Women are never going to get the vote if we sit here and say, okay, please give us the vote, and we're going to go state by state by state by state. They're particularly afraid of what's going to happen here in the South. Here in the South, there were debates about women's suffrage, even here in our own dear state of Virginia, but the Commonwealth kept saying no, 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 no. And in fact, by the time we get to 1916, they voted down suffrage three times, okay? So not, not, not a good sign, okay? Um, so, so as far as Alice and her friends are concerned, we need a national amendment waiting, waiting for the states like Virginia uh, to decide what they're going to do, it, it will be here forever. Okay. So Alice Paul decided she had to go to Washington, sitting up in New York City with the various members of NASA, just was not going to get it done. In fact, New York was New York turned down suffrage twice before it approved it in 1917. Okay. Um, so Paul appealed to Jane Addams, very famous suffragist, but also leader of the Sutherland House movement. Um, and Jane Adams got Mrs. Cat and her friends to agree to send Alice down to DC to lobby Congress, but they only came for ten dollars. So obviously they're, they're not exactly they're not exactly expecting a whole lot here. Uh, and Alice, after being told this, well, I can use my own funds. Alice was very good at raising money, and we'll meet, and she's very good at getting some very wealthy people to support her. Uh, probably most famously, Alva Belmont. We'll talk more about Ms. Belmont later on. When Paul arrived, she found that there was no headquarters anywhere, no, no, not even a room uh, for their efforts. And Mrs. Uh, William Kent, her husband was actually in Congress from California, um, did very little, as far as Alice could tell, uh, to promote the cause of the National Amendment. Um, in fact, Mrs. Kent hadn't even spent the $10 that they'd given her, okay? Uh, arriving in December of 1912, Paul rented a basement uh, in, 14, in 1420 F Street and went to work. Her plan was to challenge the Democrats, the party in power, uh, and she was willing to keep increasing pressure. What you're going to see is Alice and her friends keep kind of upping the ante uh, when the Wilson administration doesn't exactly go along, doesn't really show them much sympathy. They're going to keep kind of, you know, becoming more and more and more militant. Uh, so, uh, all right. Now, Alice and her friends had learned a great deal uh, while they were in England. These are the three women who were the leaders of the women's suffrage movement in England, the more radical part of it. Um, in England, the radical suffrage folks were called the suffragettes. And we'll talk about why that is in a few minutes. Paul and others learned a great deal from uh, the Pankhursts. Emmeline, she's the mom, and then Cristobal and Sylvia. There's a fourth, there's actually a third daughter, but she wants no part of this, so we aren't going to see her. Um, now, the problem that Alice had, though, with, with the Pankhursts was the Pankhursts advocated violence. Uh, they committed a lot of vandalism. They did things like uh, throw, throw rocks through people's windows. They threw eggs at the prime minister, although, quite frankly, Mr. Asquith was kind of a stuffed shirt, so he probably had it coming. Uh, they also slashed up train seats, uh, poured acid on golf course greens. They even went into the British Museum and smashed up a mummy case. Um, so these ladies are very, they're, they're vandals. And because of this, they get arrested. Uh, they get arrested and they wind up in, um, in Holloway, which is the women's prison near London. 
One suffragist, suffragette even threw herself under the king's horse at the Epsom Derby. Uh, she died of her injuries. Uh, so again, the suffragettes or suffragists get arrested uh, and put in Holloway, as I said, where some went on hunger strikes and were forced that. Uh, they claimed they were political prisoners and deserved better treatment. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, who had joined in with these ladies, uh, both wound up in Holloway, uh, both wound up being force fed. Um, after being force fed the first time, Alice came back to, these, came back to um, the United States. Lucy actually stayed a little while longer and went up to Scotland to help the effort to get the women's right, women the right to vote up in Scotland. Okay, so um, now women's British suffragists ignored uh, old ideas about women's place being in the home uh, or in the private sphere, as the home was called. And they insisted that women had a right to be in public spaces. Um, beginning in 1908, they staged many parades to show they were more than just a bunch of old maids and hysterical female types. Uh, they were dignified and orderly. And see, this is where Alice and her friends are going to get their ideas for the parades. They carried banners with messages. The American suffragists are going to too. Although, by the way, very few of those banners survived. Uh, Belmont Paul, which is just closed down, had a whole collection of them. They're giving them over to the to um, I'm trying to remember the Library of Congress, I believe. But the important banners we're talk we're going to talk about tonight, there aren't any of them left. Uh, either somebody's got them in an attic somewhere, or, they, or in some cases we know they got destroyed. Uh, in 1911, before uh, King George V was, was crowned, uh, they staged a huge parade in London of about actually 40,000 women uh, led by, uh, by the way, if you went to jail in England uh, for the women's movement, this you got this, this is called the Holloway brooch. Alice had one, Lucy had one. Uh, we'll see what's why I mentioned that later on. Uh, here's Anna Bryce. She's actually a member of Parliament's daughter. Uh, she's riding on a white horse as Joan of Arc. That's an important symbol. We'll get to that in a little while, too. Um, Joan of Arc, of course, is the symbol of radical women, uh, a patriot, a martyr for the cause. She's morally superior. Uh, she's militant. Uh, and she's definitely not domestic. You know, jo Joan, Joan thought she was hearing voices, if you know what jo Joan's story is, okay? Let's talk a little bit about the difference between suffragette and suffragists. Suffragists, which is the term used for American women who wanted the right to vote, um, is a word that comes from Latin. It means support or vote for somebody. Uh, and the word first appears in English in the 14th century. Uh, and it, it was defined as male, though, uh, during the reign of Henry VI in the 1430s. It was used in the United States for the first time in the 18th century. Uh, in the Constitution, and later was applied to women campaigning for the right to vote. Okay. Suffragette, which was the English term, was a derogatory term, meant to kind of diminish the women's, British women's movement uh, at a time when many British working class men were still trying to get the right to vote. In England, they give the vote, vote out according to class. Here in America, sex plays, or gender plays a role, but of course race does too. Uh, in England, it was more about, you know, we gave it first to uh, the middle class, then the respectable working class, and the, but anyway, so you get the idea, okay? So we'll begin, when Alice and her friends began their real militant phase, uh, Woodrow Wilson had just been elected president in 1912, uh, and they decided they were going to target him and the Democrats in their efforts to press for the vote. Uh, Wilson, when he arrived in Washington, you probably heard this story uh, in um, 1913 um, for his inauguration. Nobody was there at, the sta at Union Station to meet him. And that's because they were all over watching the suffragist parade that Alice and her friends had organized. Uh, about 8,000 women were parading down the street. Uh, and um, eventually uh, the situation got really out of control. Women were mobbed by guys who, quite frankly, had way too much to drink. Uh, and the army had to ride in from, uh, from one of the local forts and protect them. There was a big investigation of this, too. The DC police, by the way, did nothing. They just stood there uh, and they got investigated. So anyway, yeah. Now, at the time when Wilson is, pre is, um, is inaugurated, you can see here 
that most of the states where women could vote were all in the far west, okay? And efforts to get the vote, as I said, in, in various parts of the east had failed. New York doesn't get it till 1917. Um, there was a big push in 1915. They thought they had it. They didn't. Okay. Even though, even though they had Teddy Roosevelt supporting them. Uh, you can also see here again on the Eastern seaboard, uh, the Southern states are not going for this. Okay. They really are not. Uh, you wonder what the strike thing is. Well, in some states, they did allow women to vote in local elections, like for the school board or the mayor or something like, like that, not for president, whatever. Only in the far West do you see uh, women being allowed to vote in all elections. Okay, so, all right, well, so here's a, in Alice's parade, the person in, in the front was Inez Milholland. As I said, she's a lawyer. Um, she's also considered to be, you know, quite the, quite the most beautiful suffragist. She didn't like that, by the way. Uh, she realized that some of the other women kind of pushed her to the front because she was good looking. Uh, and she really kind of resented it. On that's her horse. She was a very good plan. She felt sure that uh, the women were safe when the men started to mob them. Uh, and she done a, she did a number of other uh, other parades like this. Okay. All right. Now, um, I guess died in 1916, and that's a very important turning point for us. Okay, in our story, um, Inez basically burned the candle at both ends when she wasn't talk, giving suffrage speeches, okay, uh, or participating in those parades. Um, she was an early, uh, early critic of the death penalty and was involved in another number of death penalty cases. Uh, she also uh, helped out uh, labor unions in New York. You've all heard of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Uh, she did what she could for the women who worked at that factory and at some of the other factories in the garment district in New York. Uh, and so she was kind of all over the place, okay? Plus pursuing a very active social life. Uh, she frequently took the, uh, took the uh, uh, Lusitania, which was still above water at that point, uh, back and forth to England, uh, where she had, as I said, had a very good time. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, as I said, she's burning the candle at both ends. In 1916, she and a number of other women go out west where the women can vote to urge them to vote for the Republicans instead of the Democrats. By the way, Inez's family are big Republicans. Her dad's a big buddy with Teddy Roosevelt. So anyway, um, so um, now when uh, she dies, this is gonna cause some problems because the women are gonna confront Woodrow Wilson about this. Uh, they've been lobbying him. They've been trying to talk him into suffrage and he doesn't budge. Wilson believes it's up to the states He's a, he's a good early 20th century Democrat. He believes in state rights. He believes in, uh, you know, basically it's up to the states to take care of this, not the national government, okay? Uh, and really, even today, if you look at the patchwork that we have, it's really um, voting, who controls, how the votes, how the, you know, whatever happens on election day, is still controlled often by states or even counties. Uh, and a lot of people liked it that way. They still do. So anyway. Um, so Wilson never really got along very well with Alice and her friends. He thought they were too pushy. They weren't deferential enough. I mean, quite frankly, he's a good Southern boy from out in the valley here in Virginia, and he expects women to be deferential. And, you know, he offers them tea and things like that, and they tell him what he can do with his tea. Uh, his second wife, Edith, she can't stand them. She calls them all kinds of words we can't repeat in mixed company, as my father would have said. Uh, so anyway, uh, so here's Alice, uh, you know, here's um, Inez dies, as I said, and at that point, the National Women's Party goes to the White House to be, meet with President Wilson, and uh, he's not very receptive, okay? Um, he's shocked. They show up, and folks, he wants to talk about the tariff and the currency issue. And things like that. I mean, how much paper money do we keep in circulation? Uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, and that's not what Alice and her friends want to talk about. They want the vote. They don't care about the tariff. 
quite frankly, if you study history today, most people don't care about the tariff. Anyway, um, so on January 9th, when he met with them, he rebuffed the request to have, have the, uh, the amendment for women's suffrage passed on Inez. Uh, in fact, he just said, it's not happening, turned around, left the room. Um, at that point, Alice Paul and Harriet Stanton Blatch put their heads together and agreed that something much more radical had to, had to happen. Okay. Uh, they decided they would pick at the White House. This is the first time that's ever happened in American history. I mean, today, everybody's picking in the White House about something. Uh, so anyway, um, to support her efforts, uh, Alba Belmont writes Alice two big checks of $5,000. That's a lot of money back in those days. Uh, and and in, in the end, uh, Mrs. Belmont gave Alice, let me see here, uh, $76,500 which is the equivalent of $1.7 million today. And there were other wealthy people that gave money too. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so a number of people are at sending Alice money to support people who are going to pick it. I mean, you got to pay, pay for their food, right? Uh, they are all going to live at Cameron House, which is where Alice and her friends are. Uh, but, you know, you got to pay for the food and the light bill and the legal fees because they're going to get arrested. So anyway, uh, well, beginning on January, January 10th, uh, 1917, 12 women uh, who were members of the National Women's Party uh, left Cameron House, which is right behind the White House, uh, to silently picket. Uh, these folks became known as the Silent Sentinels. So it's the first time anybody's picketed at the White House. Uh, carrying banners with expressions, you can see this one here. Uh, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? This is known as the New Holland Banner. This is kind of a uh, paraphrase of what Inez supposedly said when she died. Um, and this was often carried in protests, sometimes by Inez's little sister, Vita, uh, who gave up her singing career to join the suffragists. Uh, now, uh, so here are the original Silent Sentinels right there. The lady fourth from the left, who's kind of standing there by herself, she's a, from Virginia. Her name is Maud Jamison. Uh, she was a school teacher from Norfolk. And uh, so I want to highlight her. You pick it all over the place. How's one of these people that was always on the phone? She was. She was always on the phone chattering with somebody, okay? Trying to get them to do something that she wanted, all right? Uh, and they recruit, also recruited um, for some more silent sentinels. Also recruited noted DC civil rights leader, Mary Church Terrell, uh, to join them. Uh, Terrell and her daughter Phyllis often came to picket, but Alice always knew what was going to happen with the police. And when the police commissioner kind of said to Alice, we're going to start arresting y'all, um, Mary Church Terrell knew this was not going to, this would not be a good thing for her, okay? Because of course she's African American. And, you know, the DC cops did not have a very good reputation when it came to that sort of thing. Let's put it that way. Uh, so anyhow, on March 4th, uh, 1917, over four, over a thousand women picketed on the eve of Wilson's second inaugural. Oh, okay. All right. So, I said at first, Wilson kind of, you know, he was polite to them. I mean, he's a good Southern boy. Um, their banners often quoted his words right back at him, though, which must have really bothered him. Uh, and at first, most people kind of ignored them. Uh, the, uh, some people felt sorry for them. They brought them coffee, maybe, you know, warm pastries. Somebody even got the idea of bringing them warm bricks to stand up because it's cold. It's January. It's February. It's D.C., okay? Um, but when the United States entered World War I, things changed, Okay. Some of the banners began to compare Wilson to, among other people, Kaiser Wilhelm, the emperor of Germany. As you can imagine that's not going to go over well. Many thought the women should stop picketing until the war was over. And there was increasing pressure and crit critical statements about them. Um, people said they were unpatriotic. Uh, in fact, Harriet Stanton Blatch, who uh, was recruited to help run, uh, I think it's the Women's Land Army here in the United States, um, she actually tells Alice Paul, you need to back off until the war is over, but Alice isn't going to, okay? Alice is very single-minded. 
else is going to get the vote. Okay. Uh, mobs harass the women and they attack them. Uh, and what's going to happen is things are going to escalate. You see one of the banners right here. There's going to be some others. Uh, and ultimately, Wilson's going to start arresting the women because they're blocking the sidewalk, which really isn't illegal, but we will go that. Uh, Paul saw the arrival of Russian diplomats as an opportunity to get more attention to their cause. Uh, so here we go. Um, the, the banner points out that Russia, which had just gotten rid of the czar, uh, their provisional government, government had given Russian women the right to vote. Okay. Um, and of course, women in America didn't have the right to vote. So it was kind of a way to insult uh, Wilson, among other things. Uh, on June 22nd, Lucy Burns and Catherine Moray, who was from Baltimore, uh, were arrested for displaying the Russian ba Russia banner. They were the first, okay. Uh, Russian representatives were uh, visiting Wilson uh, and the women pointed out that, as I said, the provisional Russian government had given women the right to vote. Uh, after several hours of uncertainty about what the heck to do with these women, um, the courts let them go. Again, they weren't quite sure what to do with women at this point when they arrested them. The idea was maybe if we arrest them, they'll stop. We'll scare them. No, it's going to take a lot more than just dragging them down to the police station to scare Alice and her friends. Okay? Uh, so there they are. There's Lucy Burns and Catherine Morey. I love this picture of Catherine. Uh, there she is in police custody. And I'm sorry, she don't look like she's very sorry, does she? Uh, she's like, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and the cop is being very good. So uh, now, so, uh, so the Russia banner gets some people arrested. Uh, and uh, on July 4th, for example, 11 additional women, including Lucy Burns, etc., were all arrested and served three days in the D.C. jail. Uh, the women were told that if you want, don't want to be arrested, you have to keep walking. If you stop walking, you're blocking the sidewalk, we will arrest you. Now, of course, this ignores the fact that they're picketing, which is free speech, okay? And they have the right to assemble, again, violating their First Amendment rights, okay? Uh, by mid-July, D.C. authorities decided that simply arresting them, putting them in D.C. jail was not working. Something's going to happen here. Uh, and so they're going to start looking to send them to the Occoquan Workhouse. Okay. And this is the banner that really starts the trouble right here, the Kaiser Wilson banner. Uh, and there, again, women being arrested. I want to point out this lady here, Mary Morris Lockwood. She's actually from Arlington. And she had been uh, before uh, 19, well, by 1960, it's not going to happen. And so she and a number of other women jumped over to the uh, National Women's Party when Alice Paul began to recruit people here. Okay. Uh, and so Mary Morris Lockwood was actually arrested for picketing, but there's a lot of women that get arrested, but they don't go to jail. Uh, I'm going to give you some statistics. Between 1917 and 1919, approximately 2,000 women picketed here in DC. About 500 were arrested, including uh, Mary Morris Lockwood, uh, but only 168 of those actually received jail sentences. What happens in a lot of cases is the judge just says, get out of here. I, you know, it, it's, it's the, the judge just doesn't, a lot of the judges you get the sense they're like, why are we doing this anyway? Uh, 106, people, 106 women were arrested in night and were imprisoned in 1917, and 72 of those wound up down in Occoquan. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Occoquan. Okay, uh, so here's the, the conditions in the DC jail. Um, they didn't have enough room; they had everybody sleep on the floor. Can I say? Uh, now that's the superintendent of the Occoquan Workhouse. His name is uh, William H. Whitaker. We have trouble finding a good picture of him. This is actually, I think, from the Washington Star, if I remember. Old DC newspaper, which is great, by the way, if you can get a hold of it. Um, and uh, my friend Steph found this. He's been doing a lot of, of newspaper research lately. Um, as I said, we don't really have a good clear picture of him. But this is the women's workhouse in Occoquan. Uh, the Occoquan workhouse, which was the men's workhouse, opened in 1910. This was opened in 1912. Uh, it was seen as progressive. Uh, the man supporting all this was President Teddy Roosevelt. 
Uh, the workhouse took inmates out of D.C. Uh, in fact, the prison that existed in D.C. before this was just nasty, okay? Uh, and, and Teddy pushed to have it shut down. Uh, the conditions there were awful. Among other things, it was sitting right in the middle of a swamp and apparently stunk. Anyway, um, they hoped that by getting people out of D.C., fresh air, um, give them something to do, constructive, this would help rehabilitate them. The people who went to the workhouse, by the way, were, were petty criminals. Uh, we're not talking about felonies. We're talking about really, you know, misdemeanors, okay? Uh, the women at the workhouse did laundry, sewing, gardening, that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, they were housed in wooden, wooden dormitories. These were all wooden across the road, what's now Route 23, or 123, for those who are familiar with the area, uh, from the men's workhouse. Uh, and there were no cells at the women's workhouse. Now, I'll let you in on a little something. This is no longer there. This is where the water treatment plant, plant is on 123. If you're coming south on 123 uh, and uh, you're headed towards Occoquan, you're going to notice the big water treatment plant. Uh, that used, this used to be there uh, when they shut the Wharton complex, um, the prison complex. They decided to tear this down eliminate it and put the water treatment plant over there because Fairfax did kind of need a new water treatment plant at that point. Uh, the brick buildings that are across the street from the water treatment plant uh, were the later buildings for the workhouse. Uh, the um, workhouse originally was all wooden and what happened was uh, they replaced that in the 1920s. So those buildings you see now were built in the 1920s uh, and the old wooden buildings, there were a few of them left until we had a big fire there in, let me think, 1986. The prisoners actually tried to burn the place down. Uh, it didn't work, okay. Uh, but they burned some of the old wooden buildings down when they did that, okay? So, as I said, superintendent was William Whitaker. Uh, Whitaker was known for being kind of a tough customer. Uh, there were rumors that he went after people with a bolt with and things like that. Before the arrival of the suffrages of the suffrage prisoners, uh, the women's workhouse averaged somewhere between 30 and 40 inmates. The majority of them, the vast majority of them, were African American. Okay? Most were pickpockets, bootleggers, drunks, shoplifters, and prostitutes. There were a lot of bootleggers uh, by this time. Uh, I mean, this is before prohibition becomes national, but DC already had prohibition laws on the books. And by the way, Virginia did too. Uh, so for the brief time when the suffrage prisoners were there, they swelled the population of the workhouse, women's workhouse, to over 100, which really put a lot of strain on it, which was sort of what Alice wanted. I mean, Alice is kind of stressing the system however she wants, however she thinks she can, to get her point across, you need to pay attention to me, Woodrow Wilson. Now, I love this. Is the, the, uh, Alice and her friends had a, their own publication. It's called The Suffragist. Uh, there are copies of this on the library film. I believe the Library of Congress has them. And I love this cartoon. This is not the White House, the workhouse. There's Uncle Sam. Uh, that'll make you forget wanting to vote. There's a suffragist. She's mopping the floor. And there's a drunk and a dope addict and that kind of stuff. So anyway. But, um, now, um, The suffragists refused to wear the prison clothes. You see um, Ms. A Ms. Adams and hers, uh, or do their work. Uh, they encouraged other inmates to refuse to do this. Uh, although the other prisoners who were, again, mostly African-American referred to them as the strange ladies. Uh, by the way, if you read what the suffragists say about the other prisoners, you see a big problem the suffrage movement always had uh, they're very condescending towards the black women that are in jail there. Some of the things you said and they say you cringe when you read them today. Uh, at one point, the prison authorities actually tried to get the African American women to harass the suffragists as a way to kind of intimidate them. The suffragists tried to insist they were political prisoners and deserved better treatment. Uh, they had to wear the prison clothing that you see there. Uh, they had to eat broth and soup full of bugs and worms. They had a contest to see how many bugs they had in there. Uh, they slept in cold cells on unclean bedding. Uh, they had to do sewing, everything like that, and putting up with the guards making crude comments to them. Okay. Um, Ms. Adams' husband, who was a dentist in Norfolk, by the way, 
tried to pay her fine. We're only talking about $25 here. These women would rather go to jail than pay $25 fines, okay? Uh, and Ms. Mrs. Adams said, no, you're not paying my fine, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna stay here. She actually stayed in Occoquan for 60 days. Prisoners were sent to Occoquan after their arrest on Bastille Day uh, on, on July 14, 1917. Uh, now, they were sentenced to Occoquan for 60 days because they refused to pay a $25 fine. Now, this first group are interesting because they include a lot of very, very, very well-to-do and influential women, including Allison Hopkins. Allison Hopkins' husband had chaired Woodrow Wilson's reelection campaign and was one of Wilson's major fundraisers. Um, when Hopkins found out his wife was in Occoquan, he basically had a meltdown. He went over to the White House and basically said to Wilson, what are you doing? Wilson tried to say, well, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, good old plausible deniability. Um, and Ho Hopkins said, well, how would you like it if your wife was sleeping with a bunch of drunks and whores, okay? Um, now, after some negotiation, the women were pardoned by Wilson after three days. Uh, the women didn't want to accept the pardon, but they were more or less told by their husbands and their lawyers you had to. Um, the, the husbands and lawyers, et cetera, all came down in a big convoy to Occoquan. Now remember at that point, 123 was a dirt road. Okay, so here they all come in their nice cars down 123, which is a dirt road. Uh, Lucy Burns came with them. Uh, and Mr. Whitaker was not very polite to anybody. He didn't care who these people were. Uh, he basically warned the women, if you come here again, it's not going to be as nice. Uh -huh. uh, and both, both Lucy Burns and Mr. Hopkins yelled at him. So anyway, um, now, after the White House pickets uh, displayed their Kaiser Wilson banner in August, more women were sent for 30 days. Uh, authorities also began to confiscate their banners, uh, tearing them away from the women. Uh, on August 14th, 22 banners and 12 flags. The flags were the, the, the things that are the purple, white, and gold striped banners. You can see one of the women behind Alice has one. Okay. Um, the following day, 50 flags were taken. And on October, August 16th, uh, 56 Kaiser Wilson banners were taken. Uh, and during this incident, somebody actually went to Cameron House and took some shots at the place fired into the house, uh, and after that, the man who owned it, Alice and her friends didn't own it, they were running it, more or less decided Alice and her friends better move out. <laughs> and he sold it to the Cosmos Club. So anyway, uh, now, all this time, Lucy Burns is in Cameron House, and she's organizing people to make banners. Uh, remember, at that point, most women would have known how to do needlework. Uh, you know, they might have had sewing machines, but some of it, too, was being done by hand. And we think some of it too was done using stencils from what we can tell uh, and from what the people at uh, Belmont Paul told us. Uh, so, but again, this was kind of a, a, a big project. Uh, and when they weren't making banners, they were out picketing. So uh, 11 additional women were sent to Occoquan for 60 days uh, after they protested at a parade honoring draftees on Labor Day, so September 5th. Uh, their banners stated that as mothers, uh, of young men who had been drafted. They thought they deserved the vote. They thought it was outrageous that their sons could be sent off to Europe and they had no say in it. Uh, they were the first prisoners, these women who were the arrested on Labor Day, were the first ones to insist that they were political prisoners. Uh, and on October 21st, they were brought back to the DC jail because at Occoquan, there's no cells at, for the women and also there's no uh, area to put anybody in solitary. Uh, they had the only thing that they did sometimes at, at the at Occoquan at the women's workhouse was women who were considered to be really annoying. They stuck them in the hospital if nobody was in there. So anyway, um, okay. So Lucy Burns was part of this group uh, on, uh, that was that was part of that. Uh, I also mentioned I'm going to go back one slide here. Um, yeah, there's Pauline. Uh, one of the women who served 60 day sentence after Labor Day was Pauline Adams from Norfolk. Adams was a radical among Virginia suffragists. Uh, she rejected some of the more traditional um, added tactics of Richmond's Equal Suffrage League. Uh, they tried to educate and, and convince Virginia lawmakers, uh, and that didn't work very well. 
Uh, and so she decided to side with Alice Paul, like you saw already, uh, after Virginia refused to approve the Women's Suffrage Amendment in 1916. This was going to be an amendment to the Virginia Constitution. Supported by her husband, a Norfolk dentist, she often addressed crowds from the back of an open car with her head uncovered, which people consider truly scandalous. Uh, more conservative Virginia suffragists were just outraged. Uh, some of the things they said, I mean, if you ever want to read a read some of this, read some of the things that the Equal Suffrage League, which are the more conservatives here in Virginia, say about Mrs. Adams and her friends, is they're not good Southern women, uh, that sort of thing. They just want attention. We're doing all the work, whatever. Um, in 1913, Adams organized a group from Norfolk who took part in the suffrage parade that we've already talked about. Uh, she also, by the way, when World War I, when we got involved in World War I, organized a big sort of send off for the troops going out of Norfolk, which Norfolk was a major exit point for American troops. Uh, and she organized some women to uh, be trained to help guard the uh, Norfolk Naval Base. Uh, so, and, and the uh, soldiers who helped train them were very impressed with them. They said they were serious. So anyway, um, in 1917, she was sent to Occoquan for her picketing activities. On toilet paper, which they had some of, uh, using a smuggled pencil, she wrote notes to her son. They actually have these notes at the Library of Virginia. Okay, I've seen them. Um, to her son, who was at UVA, discussing the conditions. She noticed she was not even allowed to have her eyeglasses or a toothbrush, and that there were not enough blankets to go around. Uh, remember, there's no central heating at Occoquan at that point. We had to put it in when we renovated the place. Um, she joked that she hoped that her husband was not too busy to think about his old lady doing time. At one point, her husband did complain that there was nobody to cook his dinner. She, that's not correct, her niece was. Uh, under prison rules, she was not even allowed to write to her husband. She, they smuggled the information, they were smuggling things out though. Uh, leaving jail in, in uh, November, she noted to her son, it would be so nice to see sugar and milk on the table again. She went back to Norfolk, she started for the bar, and she became one of the first women in, in Virginia admitted to the bar. So, all right. Now, after September 14th, uh, 10 additional women wound up in Occoquan because they were pr protesting the condition, the report on the conditions at the workhouse. Um, a a ma matron, Mrs. Bove, had resigned because of the treatment she women were receiving from Mr. Whitaker coming into prominent, uh, prominent members of Congress. Uh, Congress, however, uh, handed the whole thing over to the DC, the DC Prison Commission, who kind of whitewashed it all. Uh, and oh no, no, nothing bad is happening. Uh, it shouldn't surprise you. It's, it's really bad, but it shouldn't surprise you what they did. So, uh, now, now, so Alice Paul at that point, as you saw, decided she was going to go out and protest too. Uh, and she wound up in, in the D.C. jail. They were going to send her to Occoquan. They didn't want her there stirring everybody up, everybody else up. Um, so Alice was arrested. She was put in the D.C. jail. Um, they shine lights in her eyes all night. They harassed her. They tried to convince her she was going to say an ease if she didn't stop. And she went on a hunger strike. Uh, and so on November 14th, there were massive protests about Alice's treatment. Uh, and there were mass arrests. Uh, and 31 women were sentenced to Occoquan, led by Lucy Burns and Dora Lewis. Uh, Burns received a longer sentence, six, six months. Well, 72-year-old Mary Nolan, there's Mary, uh, received six days. Mary Nolan was from, um, from Florida. And uh, the judge really didn't want to send her to Occoquan. He tried to talk her out of insisting she had to go. Uh, but she said to him, Your Honor, my nephew is over in France defending democracy. You know, I I'm going to do that too, okay? So the judge, you know, oh, okay. And he only gave her six days. Uh, on their arrival at Occoquan on November 15th, women refused to give their names. They all said Jane Doe and that kind of stuff, or refused to change into their prison clothing. 
Now, Mr. Whitaker wasn't there when they got there. He was actually in D.C. at a meeting. Uh, but when he got back that night, uh, he sent 40 guards with clubs to terrorize the women uh, that were imprisoned at Occoquan at that time. Many were taken across the road, across 123, which remember is a dirt road at that point, taken over to the men's workhouse and put in the adjustment cells, as they were called. Um, this is a cell block. This was, you can see there's an old wooden building there. It's gone now. As I said, it got, all this got burnt in the fire, okay? Uh, and you can see how it's attached to one building. Uh, they built these, built these sub, sub blocks here. These are known as the adjustment cells. At that point, they were used primarily for guys who had DTs uh, and were having a bad time. Uh, and so the women were put in there, uh, basically thrown in, uh, you know, uh, dragged, beaten, kicked, thrown in. Uh, Lucy Burns, uh, who was wrapped only in a blanket because she still wasn't putting her prison clothes on, uh, was handcuffed to her cell uh, overnight. And she was later moved to a padded cell, usually reserved for recovering alcoholics. Uh, the oldest suffragist, Mary Nolan, we saw her, she was thrown into her cell. Dora Lewis, wealthy Philadelphia widow, was thrown in uh, to her cell, her head hit the wall, and it was so bad that she got knocked out cold and she had a concussion. Uh, her cellmate, Alice Casu, who was from Louisiana, was so concerned she suffered a heart attack because she was afraid uh, Mrs. Lewis was dead. Uh, this is the cell, uh, one of the cells at the, women, at the men's workhouse. Okay. They were putting like two, two women in each of these cells. So We know a lot about what happened, by the way, because uh, Dorothy Day, uh, who uh, went on to found the Catholic Workers Movement, uh, was actually part of the group that was arrested. Uh, Dorothy Day was only about 19 or 20. She was a journalist. She really wasn't involved in the suffrage movement before this. She came down because one of her friends was going down here. She wanted to hang out with her friend. They both wound up in jail, okay? And Dorothy tells us a lot about what happened on the Night of Terror in her memoir, so... Uh, that's Dora Lewis, wealthy Philadelphia widow, uh, another very prominent uh, sort of leader. She helped Alice raise a lot of money uh, when Alice had some health complications. Um, uh, Dora Lewis's, Lewis's brother was up at Hopkins, and uh, he, he saw Alice at his sister's request, and he told Alice her basic problem was she needed to eat more and get some rest, which was probably true, okay? Because as I said, Al Alice also kind of tends to burn the candle at both ends. Uh, so, um, where is this? That is Dora Lewis. Uh, Whitaker also sealed off the prison and would not allow family members or their or attorneys to visit. And he tore the phone out of the wall in his office. That's how mad he was. At one point, he even got Marines from the newly established Quantico uh, to come up from uh, come up from Quantico to surround the prison. In the prison, the suffragists were moved from place to place to confuse them. Um, a number of them went on hunger strikes. Uh, and the officials used the promise of food and clean clothes to try to get them to stop what they were doing. Uh, they did things like, you know, bring fried chicken in where the women were, baked apples, bread soaked in milk. Dorothy Day talks about the bread soaked in milk. Another woman talks about it. It's really interesting how they reacted to the fried chicken. Uh, you gotta remember, most of these women are Northerners. And so fried chicken was not something that was really popular in the North at that point. I mean, now, you know, we all have, we all have KFC and stuff like that. But even when I was a kid, I don't remember that much fried chicken up North. So anyway, I originally from upstate New York. So anyway, um, one of the hunger strikers noted that she dreamed of eating a rabbit that she saw hopping around outside of the prison. Uh, so anyway, uh, on November 19th, Occoquan officials decided to force feed uh, Lucy Burns and, and Dora Lewis, who are now leading the hunger strike. There were about, I think, 13 or 14 women that were on the hunger strike. Uh, Lewis confronted Whitaker. Lewis is not afraid to speak up to Whitaker. He does not like her either. He yells at her all the time. Um, she insisted that force feeding was not going to help. In fact, it was more about abusing, abusing women and punishing them. And he was right, okay. Three other women, Alice Paul, Rose Winslow, and Kate Heffelfinger, uh, were force fed at the DC jail after they went on a hunger strike. Burns and Lewis were in such bad shape after they were force fed that the prison authorities actually had to take them to DC to the hospital. 
uh, before they brought them back because they were afraid they'd really, you know, really hurt, really done them in, they were going to die. This is a British recreation force feeding. Uh, we keep trying to get um, somebody to draw us uh, something based on Lucy and some of the other descriptions we have from Lucy and people like that. So far, we don't really have one that we're happy with. Let's put it that way. But this is a British one. So uh, Lucy was so determined they weren't going to force feed her that it took five people to hold her down. They wound up, since she wasn't open her mouth, they wound up putting the tube up her nose. Uh, the other women were fed through the mouth. So now, uh, back in DC, the National Women's Party leadership was really concerned, as you can imagine. Uh, they wanted any information they could receive on their colleagues. Some went to the DC station, train station, to ask prisoners returning from Occoquan what the heck was going on. Mary Nolan got out after, 60 day, after six days. Uh, she brought back lots of information. A young Marine, whose mom was actually a suffragist, came forward uh, and told what he'd seen there. And Matthew O'Brien, who was one of the women's lawyers, managed to get in long enough to see Lucy. Uh, she was uh, still only clad in a blanket and stretched out on a cot. Uh, he talked to her long enough uh, before they kicked him out, even though he had something saying he should be allowed to see them. So word of the women's mistreatment was getting back to DC. These are respectable, wealthy women with money to hire the best attorneys, and they did, okay? Uh, these attorneys began to press Woodrow Wilson, who at first said, well, I don't know what's going on. He's very good at doing that, you know, like a lot of politicians are. Uh, many questions, why women were in Virginia? The question people kept asking to like, shut Lorton down finally. Uh, and the women pointed out they had the financial means to challenge this business about being in Virginia, unlike the other Occoquan inmates, okay? Most of the Occoquan inmates, again, they're poor. Um, but these ladies have money, uh, and they can. that's going to be one of the points of their cases. Why are we in Virginia? Eventually, the uh, women's attorneys convinced the federal court in Alexandria, there's the old federal courthouse in Alexandria, to issue a writ of habeas corpus. Well, Whitaker tried to dodge the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, he tried to hide from those attempting to serve the writ. But on November 23rd, the women were brought in to the courthouse, you see there, uh, before Judge Edmund Waddell Jr. Uh, and Judge Waddell was kind of, kind of like, what is going on here? Many of the women who were weak from hunger strikes and mistreatment uh, had to be let in by their friends. Uh, they couldn't stand up. People, including the Judge Waddell, were shocked by their appearance. Uh, here we go. Here's Dora Lewis being assisted by her friends, okay? Uh, and this is another woman. I think this is Kate Hepplefinger uh, being helped into the courthouse. Um, and basically, the judge said, why are they in Virginia? Particularly when he read the charging documents, which said they were supposed to go to the D.C. jail, not Occoquan. Uh, and so at that point, he said, that's it. That's it. No more, no more Occoquan. Uh, and uh, the women were released from the D.C. jail, all of them, uh, on November 27th and 28th, 1917, along with wealthy Elva Belmont. Mrs. Belmont had married two really wealthy men, uh, one of the Vanderbilts and then one of the Belmonts. Uh, so she really had a lot of money, uh, which she used to help labor unions, but also help women's suffrage. Um, she was good friends with Alice and a number of the other women suffragists. Uh, Alice created the jail door pin. There you go. Kind of like what we saw from England, uh, which was given to all the women who had been incarcerated. Uh, and they had a big ceremony at the Velasco Theater, which was then in DC. Um, pardon me, in December of 1917. After this, in 1918, the course tossed out the women's convictions, feeling that they never should have even been arrested in the first place because it violated their First Amendment rights. Uh, Whitaker was, Whitaker retired. <laughs> Notice I said retired. Um, you know, I, I, work, I work for a state or I work for the state government. I know about people retiring anyway. I'm going to because I want to. Some of my friends didn't have, some people I know didn't have a choice. Uh, faced with the outcry over the suffragists' treatment in Occoquan, as well as recognition that American women had done a great deal to support the war effort during World War I, Wilson announced in 1918 he would support the amendment. Uh, he also knew that New York had been, and New York, which had the most votes, had just approved women's suffrage too. Um, now, all this time, Wilson's been talking to Carrie Chapman Catt and them 
uh, instead of Alice, who doesn't like Alice and her friends, uh, somebody who recently wrote a book about all of this noted she thought Wilson probably picked, peeked out of the curtains of the White House to see just what the heck Alice and her friends were doing and probably stayed at her gnashing his teeth. But anyway, so uh, although the White House, although the House of Representatives passed the 19th Amendment in 1918, the Senate held out till 1919. And the women kept up the pressure on Wilson and Congress. Here we are at Lafayette Park, the Lafayette, uh, Lafayette statue. Uh, this was on Inez's birthday in 1918. Um, they got arrested because the Park Service does not want you walking on their monuments. Okay, so they wound up in they wound up in the DC jail for this. Uh, and then in 1919, while Wilson was over in Europe, uh, they started burning his speeches in what were called the Watch Fire protests. Uh, and again, you can see they've got a little urn there, and they're throwing speeches in. And uh, there were there were a couple people tried to burn the president in effigy too. And so anyway, uh, in any case. Um, again, a lot of the women who were arrested for this wound up in the DC jail for between three and five days. Uh, so, in fact, there's Lucy in the DC jail. I always love that picture. She's kind of sitting there with her thing going, oh, it's me. Uh, and this was the DC jail that was reopened for the suffragists. Uh, this is the thing Teddy Roosevelt shut down. So, anyway. Um, despite Wilson's support, the Senate was reluctant to pass the amendment. Uh, there was a lot of criticism after the women burned uh, the president's speeches in the watch, watch, in the watch fires. And so Belmont and Paul decided to send a train, dubbed the prison special, on a three-week national trip in February 1919 to rally support. 26 National Party, National Women Party's members who'd been in jail uh, were on the prison special. Uh, they were jailbird, the jailbirds. There they are on their prison, prison uh, dresses. Uh, and again, this is to show these women are respectable women. They're not radical socialists, which is what people have been calling them. At each stop, the women changed into their prison clothes and spoke to the crowd. The first speaker was usually this lady, uh, Louisiane Havemeyer. Uh, she was a wealthy widow whose husband had run the U.S. Sugar Trust. So obviously she's got a lot of money. Uh, she was a prominent art collector who opened her home to the public. Uh, he went and saw our art collection and donated for the suffragists. She was a good friend of Alice Paul's, and she donated $20,000 to the Paws, uh, and then tried to burn an effigy of Wilson uh, in front of the White House. She was arrested for that. Alice Paul is interesting. When, when Louisiana, Louisiana Havemeyer gave her the money, Alice Paul said, oh, that's nice. Now go get arrested. And she did. Uh, so uh, she became one of the featured speakers on the prison special. And this is in Syracuse, which is not too far from where I'm from. Uh, he's a uh, police, one of the police captains. The younger woman with her is, is Vita Melhond. She's Inez's little sister, so. All right, so the Senate eventually gets around in 1919 to saying yes by one vote uh, to uh, the suffrage amendment. Uh, the Republicans very proudly pointed out that it was, well, they had control of Congress that all this happened, okay? The Democrats had never approved it. Now, one region that resisted the 19th Amendment was the South, was the South as we know. We didn't ratify it here in Virginia until 1952. Uh, Tennessee provided the breakthrough, however, on August 24th, after a young legislator named Harry Burns changed his vote at the urging of his mom, uh, who was a good friend of Harry Chapman Cass. With the necessary 36 states, the 19th Amendment became part of the Constitution. Now, what Alice did was as each state ratified it, she sowed a star, and here we are. Victory! And by the way, they do not know where that banner is. They're still looking for it. So, uh, anyhow, uh, as I said, very few of the banners, the really important ones, are still around. We know some of them got destroyed. Uh, we know that, who knows, maybe Alice, had, maybe they'll find this in, in, in a trunk somewhere uh, among Alice's relatives. We don't know. Uh, now, I want to show you these two ladies, just really quickly. Uh, this is Gertrude and Ruth Crocker. Uh, they're originally from Illinois, but they settled in Arlington after all of this, and they opened a little tea house in Arlington, uh, which uh, was in business uh, until the early 1960s. The little tea house attracted a lot of prominent women in the D.C. area. Uh, it was kind of a place to go, you know, have afternoon tea and sort of hang out and talk about things. But anyway, so, okay, well, there we go. Okay, well, that's it, folks. You get rid of that. That's my problem. Uh, okay, so that's it with my presentation and questions. That was great. Um, please, people, if you would like to pose a question to Professor Reagan, 
um, enter the chat room and uh, chat area and please post it there. <clears throat> a lot of people are certainly finding it interesting, Professor. They're uh, letting you know that they liked it, but we don't have any questions yet. Yeah, questions, folks, questions? It was great storytelling. Well, thank you. <laughs> to me, that's what history is. History is a story. Okay. And, uh, um, Jessica asks, what did Inez Mulholland die of? Okay. She had a combination of really, really badly infected tonsils and um, anemia. She had really, really, really severe anemia. They tried to help her with a, trans, a transfusion, uh, but to, back then they didn't really know how to deal with any of them. Uh huh. We're losing your voice there. There we go. Keep going. Back connection for a minute. Practically, um, today. So we just, if you could repeat your last couple of sentences that we, I lost the connection. So go right ahead. Oh, that's all right. All right. As I said, Inez, Inez had uh, really badly infected tonsils. She had a really bad case of anemia. Back then, they didn't know what the heck to do with that. Today, they give her some kind of antibiotic. Uh, they know how to do something with her blood. I mean, I had, an, heck folks, I had anemia. They just gave me some iron pills. Uh, but I don't think they knew how to treat any of that back then. Hmm. Remember, Medicine, medicine, even in the early 20th century, is pretty darn primitive. So anyway, yeah. Uh, by the way, Inez's father uh, never forgave Alice Paul. Never. Hmm. So. Huh. We have a question about the Lucy Burns Museum. Would you tell us more about that at the workshop? Sure. Uh, OK, we started on that project, believe it or not, about oh, 1906, in 2006. OK, so it's been a while. Um, and we started out with one little cubicle. <laughs> Uh, then we went to one of the, um, if you know anything about the workhouse, uh, you know, the art center has, um, has basically artist studios. Mm -hmm. We started out with, after the cubicle, we wound up with the studio. Uh, and then uh, we started raising money. It took us quite a while to raise money, but we have an entire building now uh, that is dedicated to the Lucy Burns Museum. Uh, about half of it is about the suffragists. Uh, we have actually the jail logs that show who got arrested when. Uh, we've got a lot of photographs and other things like that of Alice and her friends, some videos. Uh, my friend Kanina Spaulding actually uh, has produced several really good videos uh, on the subject. And then the other half of the prison, or the other half of it is on Morton Prison itself, uh, which has its own very interesting story uh, before it was shut down. Because basically, the good people of Fairfax County decided we don't want D.C.'s jail in our, in our county. Uh, which has been a problem all along, as we said. Uh, so yeah, but the Lucy Burns Museum is open. I think the latest is we're open on Saturdays in the afternoon. Uh, we have to be really careful. Um, I don't think we're allowed to have more than 10 people in there at a time. Uh, you know, the governor's policy, and you have to wear masks. Um, we do have, got, we do have uh, docents there. I've done some docent work myself. Uh, and... Uh, you know, we, we've had some problem, like we have really good problem with the Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. uh, they have their, it's not a badge, I think it's a patch. Uh, we didn't have patches when I was in the Girl Scouts, we just had badges, but anyway. But they get they can get this uh, patch uh, for doing some kind of project related to women's suffrage, and we, we've been working with them. So we have a lot of school kids, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have another question here about the descendants of these women. Were they also activists? Can you tell us anything about their descendants? Okay, we've met some of them, okay. Every, and it's really interesting. Every once in a while, somebody will come in uh, and they'll say, oh my God, that's my grandmother. <laughs> you know, because we have the picture of a lot of the women there in their, in their, in their jail uniforms. And one time this woman came in and she said, that's my grandmother. And it's funny because some of them that say, when we knew, we knew grandma got arrested, but now we know why. It was always, so apparently, a lot of these families didn't really want to talk about it, okay? Uh, and so it was, oh, now we know why. <laughs> grandma was trying to get the right to vote. Oh, that's not so bad. Uh, <laughs> oh, grandma arrested. Ooh, ooh. Um, actually, some of the women are active. 
in various kinds of, of, of uh, women's issues, like I guess you could say. Um, you got the ones that I met, some of them were very involved, well, some of them are teachers uh, and um, Girl Scouts, that kind of thing. Um, we've met Dora, one of Dora Luce's, Dora Luce's relatives. Somebody's told me that uh, apparently Lucy Burns, Lucy never got married, by the way, she never had any kids. Apparently one of Lucy's nieces has gotten in touch with us. So hopefully she'll come and talk to us and tell us some stories. Uh, but yeah, so um, yeah. And so anyway, yeah, so that, that's what we know about them. But as I said, every once in a while, one of them shows up and it's really interesting, so. Yeah, that's great. So, so one of your, you've got a, a museum fan here who, someone who has gone to it and they thought it was great. And they are saying you can tour a cell, the cell blocks, or at least yes. one. Yeah. Oh yes, we have we have um now we do have a cell block there. Uh, it was not that's not in the original cell block, okay. Uh, but that was put in when things got really bad at Lorton in the 1980s. Uh, originally, where you go to go to the Lucy Burns Museum was minimum security. Well, then when things got really bad in DC, you know, in the 1980s with, with crack cocaine and things like that, um, they decided that was going to be medium security. And so they had these cells where they put people who just couldn't behave themselves, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, or people who might be, you know, her, people who might have been informants, uh, that sort of thing. And the, we had those cells rehabbed. They were originally a mess. Uh, we had them rehabbed. We've got some of them set up, so they've got double bunks. Uh, we've been told, though, that most of them were never double bunked. They only had one person in there. Uh, we've actually had a couple of older gentlemen who were uh, guards there who've told us a lot about what went on there. So, but yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, you can go tour that. Uh, and I've had, you know, I've, I've taken people back there, and they're like, "Oh my God, this is awful." Yeah, it is. Uh, so anyway. Yeah, um, let me see what else we got here. So Tell us more about force feeding. Oh, ooh, ooh. okay, all right. Um, people go on hunger strikes, and they still do this today, by the way. Uh, now, if you're going to go on a hunger strike, probably what they're going to do to you is put something in your arm. You know, the same way they're going to give you an ID if you're sick. Hmm. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, they're going to give you like, uh, oh, what did they give me that? It's Venus. Strike, I would say, they give you like glucose and stuff like that. Okay. Mm. Well, anyway, what these ladies did was they refused to eat. Uh, and so they decided to force feed them. Uh, and what that meant was they took raw eggs and milk, mixed them together. Uh, and then they had a tube, they stuck it in your mouth, and they poured all that down into your stomach directly. A lot mm. of the women said that happened. They just promptly threw it all right back up. Um, I indicated Lucy put up a fight. Okay. Right. And so I had five people holding her down and they stuck the tube up her nose, which apparently was really a mess of blood and everything like that from what she, from what she the testimony she left behind. Uh, but yeah, uh, anybody who went through it, just, you know, uh, I mean, Alice got, Alice got forced fed times a day when she was in the DC jail. Uh, and as far as the women were concerned, this wasn't about helping them. This was about mistreating them some more. So anyway, but yeah, they, they, they forced fed other people. I know, um, you know, there've been instances like over in Northern Ireland, there were people on hunger strikes, they forced that down. And uh, so, and they still, there's people, they do that today too. So anyway, but yeah. Um, so do we have any questions for Professor Reagan? Uh, looks like you've answered all of them. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Again, it's great storytelling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. So it was an education tonight. We really appreciate it. And I'll stay on for a few minutes if anybody wanted to unmute and any additional comments. But uh, Professor Reagan, we thank you for your time tonight. We thank all of you for joining this event. Annette, any last words from you? Uh, next month, we have um, the County Manager Schwartz, who is going to be talking to us about the 1920 census. We may be done counting here, but he'll be talking to us about what the 1920 census meant to the county and why it's important today. So mm -hmm. that registration link will be available on our website and also will be on our social media sites. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Hey. I, we hope I, I, <laughs> thank you, everybody. And we hope to see you next month. Stay tuned to our social media platforms to learn more about next the next event. Thanks again. Happy holidays. Thank you.